Hey everyone, and welcome to Talking ELT, the easiest place to learn about the big issues in language teaching. Today, we'll be wrapping up our conversation about artificial intelligence with Ben and Hayo. We'll be looking at some of the ways that you can influence the development of artificial intelligence and make sure it solves the right problems by being a human in the loop. I guess that's the other part of the the piece here, which we haven't really talked about, but it's the the notion of uh, well-being, digital well-being in particular, which of course in recent years has become you know more and more recognized as a as a real issue as we engage more with um, digital resources and, and devices, etc. Um, but I think here uh, it's also important to discuss it in the context of uh, how can we how can we maintain um, our own as teachers as well as our learners. Um, social, affective, emotional um, well-being, and how can we as teachers um, really play a, a very positive uh, role in that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But especially when we're talking about a world where, and I think it's partly what you were hinting at, that you you get constant feedback on your performance. You know, that that's nice in some ways, mm. but in other ways, it can be a little bit overwhelming. For example, you know? yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, so how? Ha- ha- how do you manage that? Well, you you need a human, I think, to, to manage yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. There's an interesting um, concept, which you may or may not have come across, which is called positive computing. And it was proposed by uh, a couple of uh, researchers from MIT, um, Rafael Calvo and Dorian Peters, uh, later on also worked with... Um, uh, DC from the, f- the famous Ryan and DC self determination theory, um, and the positive computing uh, concept essentially looks to positive psychology and asks how technology can be used to actively, proactively foster well being. And for, for those listening and watching who may not be familiar with the concept of, of positive psychology, it's essentially a way of looking at humans uh, from a, a positive point of view and, and asking how uh, well systems, people, resources can help humans to flourish. So rather than looking as, uh, at psychology as fixing mental health problems, it's, it's flipping that on its, that on its head sense. and saying, how can we make you happier? How can we make you feel more satisfied with your life? And what Calvo and Peters uh, did was to say, well, there's actually a lot of examples already, and there should be more, of technology actively helping to develop that, and, and they labeled this positive computing, and they give some interesting examples of the use of, for example, augmented and virtual reality. And there's one which I'll briefly mention, which I really, really like. It's it's an AR app, it's freely available, so it's on your phone, you look through the camera lens on your phone, and what this app does is that it blurs your vision. And the reason why it does this is because it is designed to enable family members and friends of people who are suffering from an eye, uh, you know, regenerative eye disease to experience what it's like if one of their loved ones is slowly losing their sight. Oh, wow. Right? I mean, it's very difficult for, you know, a, a, a person to imagine what it's like right, mm. to, to lose mm. your sight and, and how you start bumping into things and how everything looks weird. But with this app, what they found was, they did some research in this, that, that it greatly enhanced uh, people's empathy and understanding. They also applied it, this is a different project at the University of Stanford, with um, homeless people. So they had um, non-homeless people uh, use this, this app, walk around the town and experience what a homeless person would would see so oh, that would be a good spot to maybe sleep tonight oh i have to be careful there might be police there etc and well they they interviewed these people immediately afterwards and used other research instruments to identify that well yes this greatly enhanced again the level of of kind of understanding that people had about the uh, the plight of of homeless people and then they came back six months later and it turned out that those levels of empathy had remained uh, okay. equally high so it, it had a, a long-term positive uh, impact and those are really wonderful examples that um, you know potentially we can also think of in the area of education of, of language mm-hmm. education where I think as humans we would feel quite happy to make a contribution right yeah 
I, I think we're moving away from AI as a ticking time bomb here. I think okay. we've got some, got some, some nice stuff coming. <laughs> it's, it's getting more yeah. positive, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, uh, because I've just been traveling. I've been uh, thinking about how, coming back a little bit to uh, the English as a lingua franca, how your ability to communicate in English is partly about your awareness of what the person you're speaking to will understand, you know, and, and therefore you have to be able to adjust, even if you if you speak fluently, but if, the, if you realize the person you're speaking to is not going to understand that, you have to adjust your, your language. So I'm just, so I'm trying to think of your example and think of it in a language mm. learning uh, um, uh, context. context, you yeah. know, is, is there a way that, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a way that AI can help you become uh, more aware of your communication as a as an English speaker and I, I, I'm, I'm avoiding the word using native speaker because I think mm -hmm. anybody mm -hmm. who's very fluent can can uh, find that uh, you know th they're not adjusting their language mm -hmm. yes, to, to their uh, interlocutor. That's very mm -hmm. nice yeah that's mm -hmm. a, a really wonderful mm -hmm. idea and and it also relates to the position paper that I've just written for Oxford University Press on teaching yeah. refugees oh, yeah. um, because for example as a teacher uh, you know, having some insight into the linguistic and social and other experiences that uh, learners in your classroom might have had will obviously enable you to much better attune your delivery and your support, etc., to yeah. those those learners' needs. But I, I also think, uh, and it can relate to what you're saying, is I, I think we're at the moment we're in a stage of here's some fantastic new technology. You know, it's really great, and we're thinking how can we use that technology in education. But when we're talking about um, a year from now, two to three years from now, uh, we, we have to be thinking, well, what are the problems we're actually trying to solve mm. and working backwards from that? At, at the moment, I think we're working forwards from the technology rather than uh, kind of bearing in mind what's our problem in the yeah. first place. True, mm. true. But at the same mm. time, we also need to keep the openness of mind to recognize that there will be... Mm. That there will be um, both solutions to problems that we don't yet recognize exist as well as um as well as uh problems that will emerge that we cannot yet anticipate as well as potential solutions that we cannot yet imagine right okay so you see when when i'm listening to podcasts sometimes people will say things like that which is really i know as a, are really interesting but i i'm thinking well give me an example because i think i'm not really sure what you have well how in can mind. you give an example of something you 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 can't anticipate <laughs> oh, yeah, yet yeah, okay. but but okay. for example um i i can think of something reasonably practical because it it sort of exists which is something that emerges from a good learning analytics system mm -hmm. right uh, and there's not many of them because too often the human has been left out of the loop and it's just an engineer who designs the system, as you yeah. said earlier, right? But if you have a really well-designed and well-maintained, well-monitored um, educational system, which has a learning analytical or educational data mining engine, shall we say, running in the background, then it should not only be able to give you answers to questions that you have but it might also <clears throat> provide you with insights that you that you yourself wouldn't have come up with so going back to the earlier example of complex dynamic <clears throat> sorry complex dynamic systems mm. you might the system might help you to realize that your learners i'm just making something up yeah, here yeah. your learners level of motivation or engagement in class is low not because of anything that you did or didn't do in your class. It's because the day before, they always take another class and that teacher gives a tremendous amount of homework mm. and the kids are just bloody tired by the time they come to your class the next morning, right? Yeah, It's a fairly mundane example, but you would never in a complex system like an educational context, you wouldn't recognize, you wouldn't no. know, you don't even know that the students are taking someone else's class and what's happening there. Yeah. And it's those hidden variables those hidden connections that can well often in in reality of course have a tremendous impact and yeah. being able to visualize that or being alerted to it by a system well that's a, an example of an insight that you and i wouldn't have probably come up with ourselves yeah and uh, that, that's interesting that reminds me conversation with 
Professor Bart Rientes of, of Open University, oh, yeah, yeah. Professor of Learning Analytics, who they're talking about the kind of learning analytics which is, which is kind of popular at the moment, which is universities tracking engagement of students. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's quite nice because it, it gives them a predictive uh, power of who's going to succeed, who's yep. not going to succeed, what problems are. And, it, and he was talking about similar things that you, you identify uh, drops of engagement or someone uh, disengaged completely. And then obviously you find that, the, the, not obviously, but o- often the, the, the cause of it is nothing to do with the course. Right. Um, and it, it can be really difficult to, uh, as a teacher, to know uh are you having to adjust your teaching or is there some other course? So, uh, as you say, the more we have sources of data which are giving us information about not just uh, that course but other aspects of their programme, the more likely we are to join the dots together, mm. I suppose. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think we should do a, a regular podcast on uh, AI. I think we should. I think there's enough to talk about. Yeah. So well, and, and it, it, this is the interesting thing. It will very rapidly continue to develop. Teachers will continuously have new questions to ask about it, as, yeah. for example, new plugins are developed for language education or for assessment or what have you. Yeah. And there are so many interesting uh, new technologies coming out as well that, you know, the implications of which would be really interesting and I think very useful for teachers, you know, to, to yeah. hear about. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just in the years time thing, it might have, Exactly. Yeah. So, so just have a regular, uh, a regular return. I like yeah. it. I like it. I mean, we'll get you up on screen. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, particularly because at the moment that that thing which is, I think, has triggered a lot of the the change has been the natural language processing mm. element of it. But it is based on fluent use of the language rather than learn a language. So that the, there's a there's a dimension which is not there yet, which is uh, understanding. Um, you know how how language competence develops and and plugging that into the whole uh, the whole system, which is, we, we don't have that at the moment. That there are there are th- there's a perspective on different grades of education. So you can talk about what does someone at fifth grade or mm. tenth grade know. You know the the, the, the chat GPT can can handle that, mm. but it doesn't really. I don't think at the moment have that dimension of a A2 Spanish speaker mm, using course. English. You know, what what is that perspective? And I can see that changing in the next year. Mm, or the next for sure. Years. Yes. Well, it requires somebody in our field yeah. to say, well, here here is the interlanguage yeah. uh, of a typical learner of this language at this level. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, please, agent, AI agent, yeah. adapt yourself to, to this. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So for those of you listening, if you have ideas around this, please, you know, yeah. run with them because that that's what we need. We need we need the people who work in a given discipline and whether you're working as a nurse or as a teacher, that doesn't really matter all that much, but we need the human in the loop to say this actually doesn't matter so much. Let's not focus on that. This is what we should really care about, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because without that voice, decisions will be made for us they will be made by the algorithm but we should be the algorithm yeah right and and we should bring these the, the technology and the the human side together in what we think is the best possible way and then we remain in control absolutely, absolutely. thanks for listening to this episode of talking elt the easiest place to learn about the big issues in language teaching That brings us to the end of our conversation on artificial intelligence, and I just want to say a big thank you to Ben and Hayo for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to learn more about this issue and others like it. Or if you want to learn more about artificial intelligence, big data, and other emerging technology trends, you can download our position paper on the topic, written by Hayo. Just follow the link in the description. Thanks for joining us.